Okay, great. Thanks everyone for being here. I am, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> let me, uh, right, my name is Dong Song. I'm a professor at UC Berkeley and uh, as I mentioned, also founder of Oasis Labs. So today I will talk about um, data sovereignty and uh, decentralized data science. Okay, so uh, as we all know, uh, the uh, great advancement of blockchain has brought a lot of new capabilities and applications for us. Uh, with Bitcoin, we have self-custody of money, and with uh, uh, Ethereum, we have programmable money and financial assets. So the question is, what other new capabilities do we need and uh, uh, by utilizing blockchain and other technologies that we can provide? So first, let's look at another uh, really important and exciting domain as well. Um, <clears throat> as we know, data is a key driver for modern economy and uh, the lifeblood of AI and machine learning. And uh, more and more data is being collected every day. And uh, uh, there's estimates that a significant percentage of EU's GDP uh, comes from <coughs> value from personalized data. And the global data economy is growing exponentially as well. However, a lot of this data is sensitive and uh, as a society, we have been facing unprecedented challenges in how sensitive data is being used. So first, <clears throat> individuals have lost control over how their data is used. Oftentimes, uh, <laughs> users' data are being sold or misused even without users' awareness and knowledge. And also today, we see um, <clears throat> with the current uh, internet and web uh, setup, users' data is being locked in different data sil uh, in different silos uh, as these web services provided by different entities. And also, furthermore, um, for businesses and also for governments and so on, it's actually really difficult uh, to utilize uh, valuable data. And, and largely because of data silos and privacy concerns. So the question is, can we develop a new paradigm to address many of these challenges? And in this talk, I will show you how we can combine blockchain and privacy computing technologies to enable what I call data sovereignty and programmable data assets. So what I mean by data sovereignty, <clears throat> so the goal of data sovereignty is uh, several fold. So one, we want to establish data rights. Uh, for, uh, yeah, we want to establish data rights. And also we want to enable uh, control the use of data with the privacy detection and the data use policy. And with the established and enforcement of uh, data rights, we can then create data assets uh, with the goal to enable frictionless use of data and with appropriate value attribution. And as these mechanisms are being established, the hope is that we can create new types of um, structures um, such as data commons so that we can enable decentralized data science to make it easier to uh, utilize data and at the same time to provide um, uh, protect, uh, privacy protection for data and also fair distribution of value from data. So to enable this, we need a new, uh, we need a new type of uh, uh, technologies. In particular here, um, uh, we propose an uh, auditable policy compliant data platform with decentralized trusts to enable the goals that I mentioned. In particular, uh, with this platform, it satisfies a number of, uh, the goal is to satisfy a number of desired properties. One is we want to enable control, in particular to enable data owner and data producer <clears throat> uh, to be able to specify policies of how they want the, their data to be uh, utilized. And we want to ensure that the data consumption complies with the data use policies. 
and it needs to be privacy preserving, um, including, for example, data confidentiality is protected during data consumption. And it's important to provide auditability uh, such that the data usage, uh, uh, the data uh, producer and data owners and other authorized parties can easily audit data usage uh, <clears throat> by having data usage logs on the uh, immutable ledger. And finally, we want the system to have decentralized trust so we don't have to rely on any uh, on trust of any single party. So how do we design and develop uh, such a platform to satisfy uh, this uh, list of properties? So here are some key components uh, <clears throat> that are needed for building such a platform. Uh, we need a distributed ledger um, <clears throat> here in the blockchain to provide uh, immu immutable logs of users' rights to data, their use policies, and also the record of how their data has been utilized. And we need the decentralized key management um, <clears throat> to handle the, uh, the keys uh, for uh, data encryption and decryption. And we uh, need secure computing to protect the computation process from leaking sensitive information. And finally, uh, we need a component to be able to track uh, data use policy and also automatically uh, check for compliance for programs that try to utilize data to ensure that these programs uh, comply with the user's uh, uh, data use policy. So when we put these components together, we can enable an auditable uh, policy compliance data platform with decentralized trust. So here is how uh, such a platform uh, will, uh, can, can, can work. So, uh, so first, the, uh, the data providers uh, in this case will, um, <clears throat> Uh, for their data, uh, will encrypt the data and also uh, bundle the data with uh, their data use policy, and uh, commit this to the to the blockchain. So that's for the data owner, data provider side. And now for data consumer side, for example, a data analyst may want to utilize the data um, through a analytics or machine learning program. Or other types of applications. So the data consumer in this case um, submits then the program that it wants to run on the data. And uh, there's a, a component here called access controller, which then <laughs> the access controller monitors the blockchain so that it always has the latest uh, <clears throat> version of users' data use policies on their um, data, uh, data bundle. And, uh, and also as the access controller receives the, um, <clears throat> the latest policy and the uh, data analyst program, it will utilize a static analyzer to check that the policy, uh, to check the policy against the program. And also in certain cases, it will output a residue policy that will govern the use of the computation results. And also the second analyzers um, uh, uh, analyzes the, the program. And if it, uh, <clears throat> uh, if it checks that the program is, uh, uh, the program complies with the data use policy, it will then send a proof of policy compliance to uh, the distributed key manager. And uh, and then the access controller will, in this case, instantiate a secure execution environment. Uh, we can have different solutions for the secure execution environments. And in this particular example, it's instantiated uh, using uh, trusted execution environments with secure hardware. And, um, and the distributed key managers then sends essentially the decryption key into the uh, trusted execution environments after appropriate attestation. And then the, um, 
uh, the program can then be run inside the, the trusted execution environments uh, with data being decrypted. And the final results will be uh, encrypted with the residual policy and the results and the residual policy will be committed to the blockchain. And depending on the residual policy, the analyst can then either download the results or uh, can query the chain model around additional programs that will satisfy the <clears throat> remaining, for example, uh, residual um, policy and, and so on. And also data providers uh, and other uh, authorized parties can inspect the blockchain at any time to see how their data has been used. And also one thing that the blockchain in this case only uh, stores the essentially the, the commitments and the actual data and so on can be stored uh, in other layers of the, uh, of the blockchain, for example, uh, a decentralized storage system uh, for uh, availability. So overall, then uh, with this system, we can enable, um, what I mentioned earlier, as an auditable policy compliance uh, platform, a, da uh, a data platform uh, with decentralized trust. So with such a platform, it can enable many new uh, use cases and applications and address many challenges that I mentioned earlier. And also now it's a great time uh, to push forward along this direction. Uh, for example, with the uh, recent GDPR, SSPA regulation and so on, and very important right, uh, data rights for users uh, that has been established is portability. So in this case, uh, the regulation states that the data subject shall have the right to receive the personal data concerning him or her, uh, and, and, and so on. So I won't read through the text, um, but uh, in general, uh, this new uh, data portability requirement uh, enables uh, or requires the uh, different uh, uh, web application and services to uh, provide data in a portable uh, machine readable form that's uh, easily um, accessible by users. And by utilizing um, uh, this capability, users can now um, extract their data from the different uh, data silos uh, on the web. And then by utilizing the platform that I just mentioned, they can now build a personal data vault, which contains their data across different uh, web services and enable users to now uh, maintain control of their data and enable their data to be utilized by third-party applications uh, as well under uh, their uh, use case, uh, uh, use policies. What this can achieve, can enable uh, is uh, right. so, 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 so there are broad spectrum of uh, usage scenarios and applications uh, that this can uh, enable. So for example, now with different uh, data owners and different producers uh, have control of their data, their data can also be pulled uh, into new structures uh, such as uh, data commons. So data commons can help govern uh, can help pull data from different owners, uh, different uh, data owners and producers, and be governed uh, under um, different types of data use policies. So uh, in this case, then data commons can enable uh, new types of data uh, utilization paradigm, uh, such as what I call uh, decentralized data science. So in this case, the data owners and producers, they can um, publish their, uh, register their data sets uh, with uh, their use case, uh, use policies specified into distributed uh, data catalogs. And um, uh, data consumers and data analysts can search through these distributed data catalogs to find relevant data. And uh, they can write their data analytics and machine learning programs 
over uh, different data sets and data sources. And then um, the distributed platform, uh, as what I described earlier, can then be utilized to provide distributed secure computing uh, while ensuring the program is compliant with the uh, user specified uh, data use policies. So with this approach, it can, uh, it can enable this new paradigm of decentralized data science, where it can reduce friction of data usage, remove data silos, and enforce a strong security and privacy protection. And I strongly believe that in 10 years, uh, such data trust and data commons will become predominant uh, ways of utilizing diverse sources of data, enabling ownership economy where users benefit from their data as owners and partners. And uh, also in 10 years, data stewards and fiduciary and trustees will be a new class of entities important in the data ecosystem, managing and protecting users' data and growing its value. And in 10 years, huge economic value will be created through these new forms of data trust and data commons, orders of magnitude higher than today's data marketplace. So, so far I've talked about the overall auditable policy compliant data platform with decentralized trusts. And I mentioned about the key components. So for most of the uh, key components, I think the audience here um, is already fairly familiar. So I won't go into the detail including the blockchain, decentralized key management, and secure computing. And also the secure computing here can be done uh, utilizing different types of solutions, including secure hardware or MPC and so on. So I want to briefly just mention a little bit more in terms of the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the first component, the uh, uh, program policy compliance uh, checking component to ensure that the program is compliant with the user's um, data use policy. So first, let's look at why this component is needed. So, so far, when people talk about uh, protecting data privacy, most of the discussion actually mainly focuses on secure computing. However, here, I want to emphasize that secure computing is only part of the solution when it comes to protect user's data privacy. And um, as, uh, uh, as you may recall, uh, secure computing, the goal is to protect the computation process from leaking sensitive information. But it doesn't actually uh, talk about anything about what, uh, uh, what is being computed, uh, the, the program um, <clears throat> uh, for the computation. For all we know, um, through the secure computing, uh, even though the computation process is protected from leaking sensitive information, but the program itself could actually be uh, uh, trying to steal uh, user's data, for example, copying out uh, the, the original data uh, and so on. And hence, to protect user's data privacy, as we utilize data, it's important to ensure that the program and the computation output is not violating uh, user's data privacy and the data use policy. So of course, this is a much more complex problem than just trying to protect the computation process from leaking sensitive information. Because the data use policy can be uh, fairly uh, complex and rich. So here we can consider a broad spectrum of different types of data use policies. So for the simplest uh, form, we can consider just simply whitelist uh, uh, different uh, programs that may have been um, audited by third parties and so on. Uh, and also in certain cases, the, uh, the data provider wants to ensure that the program that's trying to consume the data is compliant with privacy regulations. In particular, in, this, uh, in the case where the data provider is the data controller. And also in other cases, uh, the user may want to uh, only allow computation over the data that's eventually private. 
and hence, uh, to uh, of course, to um, uh, to ensure that the um, the program satisfies the uh, uh, the specified data use policy, it uh, can be quite uh, complex and challenging, and um, uh, and this LC has received much less uh, attention. Uh, and there's much less work than, for example, the area of secure computing. So here I want to just talk a little bit about some of our recent work uh, in this uh, space as a first step towards addressing uh, this question. We, uh, right, so uh, in particular, in order to enable this decentralized data science, we want to enable automatic policy enforcement. And in order to enable automatic policy enforcement, here uh, we need two components. One is we need to have a policy encoding language uh, to provide a formal language to encode <coughs> the various privacy policies. And in our recent work, we uh, propose a policy encoding language called pre-policy. And the second component is uh, automatic uh, policy uh, check, a uh, compliance check um, to uh, uh, with the set analysis to check whether a certain program, for example, in this case, a Python program, satisfies uh, the privacy policy specified in the pre policy. So for the policy encoding language, uh, it has a number of uh, uh, desired uh, <laughs> properties that we would like to achieve. Uh, one is uh, user friendly. Uh, so for example, we want the policy to easily match uh, natural language description. So it's easy for users to see and uh, to specify their uh, intention for the policies and then um, their uh, intentions can be then formalized into a uh, formal uh, privacy policy. And we want it to be compositional, uh, in particular, given that uh, we, uh, with decentralized data science, we may need to utilize data across different data sources and so on. So it's important to be able to uh, compose privacy policies from different data sources too. So in this case, the privacy policy has different uh, policy clauses that can be easily composed. And also we can specify <coughs> uh, different attributes uh, in the uh, policy language as well. Uh, and we want the policy language to be easily extensible also. So in particular, uh, uh, the language uh, allows specification of different types of attributes to capture different uh, semantics uh, uh, required. And one can specify then a different attribute value. So this way it's easy to extend uh, the privacy policy. And finally, we want it to be really expressive and uh, to be able to support different types of privacy policies. So here's an example with our pre-policy we can actually encode different um, <clears throat> requirements in different uh, privacy regulations uh, into the uh, privacy uh, policy language. And with the Priv Analyzer, it uh, performs static analysis of the uh, Python program to automate, uh, automatically check whether the program satisfies the privacy policy. And in particular, it's based on the abstract interpretation framework uh, so, so here's an example where given the input of a Python program and, uh, uh, and a policy, we, uh, with the abstract interpretation, we actually develop uh, func uh, <laughs> essentially uh, function summaries. And uh, as we go through the, um, <clears throat> the Python program, uh, we also <laughs> utilize the function summaries to then also track what clauses in the original policy has been satisfied and track the residual policies. So in this case, in the end, we output the residual policy uh, that uh, still is needed to govern the computation output. And we have done evaluation of our uh, private analyzer using real world uh, uh, Python programs uh, in, uh, selected, uh, including random selection and also top uh, ranking programs um, uh, from the uh, Kaggle uh, competition uh, platform. And so we show that uh, our 
A system can correctly enforce real-world analysis programs and with very small, uh, very low uh, overhead. So overall, that's an uh, 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 overall. Uh, so that's how they, uh, uh, as a first step, how we can develop this automatic policy enforcement component. So as we uh, combine privacy computing and blockchain in the platform that I mentioned, essentially this enables us to create a new type of assets uh, that I call here data assets. So with blockchain, it can, uh, again, provide a immutable log uh, for uh, users' data use policies uh, and also <laughs> of how the data has been utilized. And with the privacy computing, it ensures that data remains private during compute and also um, ensures that uh, the data use policy is, uh, is enforced. So overall, uh, this capsule of data and policies creates uh, a new type of asset, data assets, to enable data to be utilized uh, in a privacy preserving fashion, and at the same time to enable uh, and also uh, ensure that the data use is compliant uh, with the data use policy. So uh, at OASIS, we have been uh, developing uh, technologies uh, towards uh, these goals. And with the OASIS platform, we can um, essentially enable this data assetization and data tokenization to uh, unlock a new responsible data economy where users and businesses can maintain uh, control of their data and maintain their data rights, and also at the same time, to earn value from their data assets. So we applied uh, uh, our technology in, uh, in, in different domains. And one example domain is in uh, gen genomic data. As we all know, uh, um, genomic data is one of the most uh, private uh, data uh, one has. And with our technology, we can uh, we enable users uh, for the first time to become owners of their genomic data and to be able to maintain control of their data and at the same time to enable their data to be utilized in a privacy preserving way. Users can give consent to how they want their data to be uh, utilized, for example, uh, by um, a certain uh, genomic uh, uh, data analysis company and the genomic data analysis company can run their uh, analysis in the secure execution environment uh, and uh, provide the results to the user. And in this way, uh, users' data is being utilized in a privacy preserving way and uh, users can gain benefits from that. So overall, by utilizing uh, uh, technologies as I just mentioned, uh, we hope to be able to build uh, towards a responsible data economy where uh, we can establish and enforce data rights. Data rights form the foundation of data economy and can prevent misuse and abuse of data. And also uh, uh, with the responsible data economy, we hope to be able to uh, enable fair distribution of value created from data so users can gain benefits from their data. And ultimately, uh, we hope to enable efficient data use to maximize social welfare and economic efficiency to uh, enable data to be utilized uh, by individuals, organizations, governments, and societies. So overall, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, uh, so far with blockchains, it has uh, enabled uh, new capabilities and applications, including self-custody of money, programmable money, and financial assets. We hope that by combining blockchain and privacy computing, we can enable uh, even broader uh, application, uh, enable broader application domains and uh, new capabilities to enable data sovereignty and the programmable data assets. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dawn. Uh, we have time for you to answer maybe one question if you want to 
take a look in the chat window. I think there were there were one or two. Hmm. Okay. Do I just pick the questions? <laughs> Um, well, I guess uh, there was this oh, question oh, about. To... Sorry. Oh, right. Oh, you want to pick a question? Uh -huh. No, it's, I think most of the questions came from Sylvain. So uh, maybe Sylvain, if you okay, just want okay. to. Okay. Uh, okay. So I can just move through. I see. 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 Okay. 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 So. Ask, okay. So uh, I think there are a couple questions listed here. Um, one is, what's the difference between a policy and residual policy? So essentially. A residual policy is a policy also, but in particular, this residual policy, instead of um, like the original data use policy that's specified by uh, the data owner and the data producer, the residual policy is automatically generated as data is being computed. So if you recall the example that I showed in my slides earlier, so in that case, uh, the data is uh, <laughs> use policy actually requires two parts is uh, the essentially the program, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, requires both uh, essential filter on the age uh, as well as, I think, another attribute. Um, but in this case, the program uh, only satisfies one part of the policy. So that's what it means is that in this case, the program can still compute, but the results uh, of the computation will be encrypted under this new residual policy. So, so for example, if let's say the, uh, the policy just requires differential privacy, and then if a program is shown to be differential private, then in the end, in this case, the residual policy is empty. So then the end result will now need to be encrypted and anybody essentially in this case can see the results. But however, if the, uh, the use uh, policy in this case, as I mentioned, requires certain attributes uh, to be satisfied or maybe it requires a particular type of uh, rows to access it, then the computation results will be uh, encrypted under this residual policy that's automatically computed uh, from the, uh, from the, uh, the policy uh, analyzer uh, to govern the final, uh, the computation results. So for example, then the computation results can be then consumed by another program, which then may then satisfy the, the residual policy. And then hence the, the final computation results in this case can then be, uh, for example, either include types or uh, right, be consumed by the, the analyst in the end. And- uh, Actually, I think, we'll, I think we'll leave it there uh, since we're a bit over time. Uh, but Don, if you want to answer more questions in the chat window or take them in Gather Town later, that, that would be great. Right. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah thank you. Okay. Thanks again, Don. Right, thanks. <laughs>